nobody is objecting to having the class recorded. All right, so the recorder is on, um, so that means everything that I talk about. Okay. Hello. Yes, okay. So we are, yes, go ahead. No, this is a, a wireless mic. The reason why I have to wear it you know, in this kind of funky way is because if I wear it here, it will, I, my voice would saturate the mic. The mic is too sensitive. You know, I mean, when was the last time you got a mic that was too sensitive? Apparently, this is one of those, okay? Um, so if I put it here, it's gonna saturate, you know, which means you know, the audio is gonna sound awful you know, when you guys have to listen to me through the recording. So that's why I have to put it here so it's not directly you know, down here. Um, I guess it would capture your voice a little bit better too, but for the most part, it doesn't capture you know, um, um, you know, from, the, from the audience. So if you ask the question, I have to repeat the question if it needs to be recorded. Um, all right, cool. <clears throat> so are there any questions about the lab on Tuesday? How was it? Mm, sorry? Pretty straightforward, okay. Any other comments? Nope, okay. So this is a, it's a very typical thing, you know, the lab of the day is going to be kind of, you know, a hands-on thing, you know, on the very topic that we talk about in the lecture. So that means, you know, missing the lecture is not a good idea, okay, um, because, you know, uh, you really need the lecture material to do the lab for the most part. All right, and I noticed that not everybody has gone through the prerequisite concept checklist. It is okay, we still got time, okay? But I highly encourage everybody to go through that checklist. Um, the checklist, you know, this test, so-called test, uh, does not count to your grade. It is all multiple choice, and you can reattempt as many times as you want. So in other words, it is no more than just a little self-assessment so that you know, you know, how much you know or don't, okay? You know, which is the second part is the part that is important, okay? How much of the material I assume that you know that you do not know. Now, if that is an empty set, if there's nothing, great, okay? On the other hand, if you're going like, I was never taught ternary operator, which is the question mark colon thing, look it up. If you're kind of shaky on pointers, which is the ampersand, the asterisk, ampersand, and the am, uh, asterisk, look it up, okay? You know, th th those are called the address of and the dereference operators. Um, if you're not quite sure what is the dash and then the greater than, greater than symbol, it is referencing a structure that is pointed to by a pointer. It's referencing a member of a structure that is pointed to by a pointer. So if that syntax is new to you, then you need to look it up because those are supposed to be the topic in CISP 360. And that's why we have a prerequisite of CISP 360. All right, so we still got some time before we have to utilize those concepts that I'm assuming that you already understand. So you have some time to look up those particular concepts. And if you're reading the references, you know, if you're reading uh, C++ your reference online and you go like, I'm really not sure what this means, come to the office hour. I'd be more than happy to explain that and you'll use examples to illustrate it. All right, so with that said and done, we are continuing on the um, module that we were on you know, the other day. Um, someone asked me a question of you know, how do we read all this stuff here? For the most part, you know, just kind of sequentially. Um, I also got a new tool that I have a link here, you know, which is called your know, Sigwin based you know, River Spider. Um, you can set it up on a thumb drive, and once you set it up, it's useful throughout the entire semester. So this is something that you might want to consider if you are using Windows. Um, if you're using Linux, most of the command line stuff that I illustrate will work you know, kind of verbatim, more or less. You kind of you still have to understand the concept of how to specify a path. On in the command line interface. Um, you can avoid doing that until the middle part of the semester, then it becomes almost unavoidable. So I would suggest people to spend some time and learn how to use the command line interface. 
Um, yeah, so that's about all I need to talk about for now. Oh, there's one more thing. Um, if you want to go back and repractice some of the labs that have been um, assigned already, you can go back to this module, which is titled the Practice Stuff. Okay, so those are basically just duplicates of the labs that you are doing at the end of each lecture, except these do not count for points. So I only release these after the due date of the lab of the day. But then you, know, you can, if you want to go back and practice again, you, know, you can do so. If you're saying, I'm missing certain instructions, you know, but I cannot get back into the lab, you can always you know, go back here and then repractice. So are there any questions about these um, resources that you can utilize in order to get more familiarized with the content? Because the lab stuff is actually important too. You know, I put some of the instructions and expansion of your know, concepts into the lab instructions. Are we good so far? All right. <clears throat> so I'm going to hide this here for now because you know there's only uh, there are only the two activities that we did earlier. So what I would do next is to kind of go back to the module that we were on. Um, and last time we already talked about the 2N2P circuit or 2N transistor 2P transistor you know, circuit. Um, these two are the N transistors and these two are the P transistors. And together, this particular circuit implements a logic gate that is called the NAND gate. NAND, we talked about that in the previous lecture as well. <clears throat> in fact, we went quite far down here. So the text here actually describes you know, what happens when the input, you know, which one is a zero, which one is a one, what happens to the transistors, which one is on, which one is off, and why the output reads a one or a zero. So you're expected to read the document, okay? Um, preferably before the lecture, but you know, definitely after the lecture, okay? So this is you know, something that you know, I expect people to do um, in this class. All right, so we eventually got to this portion. I'm just zooming in a little bit. <clears throat> so eventually we got to this portion here, uh, and then we talked about the NAND operator. The NAND operator is basically just the negated AND. So in C++ syntax, it looks like this. W, which is the output of the NAND gate, okay, is the negation of the input conjunction, okay, AND it together. So we talked about this already last time. Are there any questions about this part? Any questions about the concept of a NAND operator? So when we look at things as an operator from the programming perspective, from the circuit perspective, it is called a gate. So they really mean the same thing. You know, one is a symbol in a circuit. The other one are symbols that we type in in a program. But basically, a gate is really the same thing as a Boolean operator. All right, so I'll be doing okay so far with this notation here. W, which is the output of that circuit that we talked about last time, is really just the negation of the conjunction of the two input pins. Okay, I'm, I'm assuming there are no questions, okay? All right, okay. <clears throat> so I also talk about different types of notations, you know, because you know I do introduce you know, these notations and mix them up a little bit in this class. So in math symbol, the negation looks like a little clip here, and then the conjunction looks like a inverted V symbol. So that's really just a you know, mathematical notation. It means exactly the same thing as this expression in C or C++. If you are in computer engineering, if you're designing chips, um, then typically engi computer engineers would use the dot notation, which is kind of like multiplication, to represent conjunction, and then they would use an over bar to represent negation. Okay, just different type of notations. And sometimes, you know, they won't even bother with a dot in between, so they would just, you know, use x, y without a dot in between. It looks like x times y, but in the context, it really means the conjunction between X and Y, and then use the over bar to mean it is the negation of the conjunction, the entire thing. 
So do we have any questions about the alternative uh, representations of conjunction and, dis and negation? Yes. You mean this? Um, it is its own symbol. It's called a wedge. Um, so you know, if you want to learn how to type this in LaTeX, you can right click and then go to show math as, and then go to tech commands. So this is called a wedge. Um, so it is not the lambda you know, um, symbol. But that's a, I, I understand why you think it is a lambda symbol, because it looks a little bit like it, okay? All right, <clears throat> so section 3.4 talks about you know, why NAND is all we need. I think at the end of the previous lecture, I did mention that, but I did not explain how to use the NAND gate to implement all of the other logical operators that we are familiar with. So the first one is negation. So here we have the negation of x. It really is the same thing as x NAND x. This is the NAND operator symbol, you know, which, is, which looks like an up arrow. And I think I know why it looks like an up arrow, because it looks like they are using the um, wedge symbol, but they try to do a cross you know, to mean the negation of, and that's why it eventually it becomes the up arrow you know, symbol. But anyway, it's just a symbol. You know, this is you know, x NAND x is the same thing as the negation of x. All right. I just made a claim. What claim am I, did I make? I made the claim that there's an equality here. I claim that the negation of x is the same thing as, as x NAND x. So what do you do when I make a claim? Prove it. Prove it. Okay, very good. So we're going to prove it. How do you think we're going to prove this? A truth table. Very good. All right, so we are going to use a truth table. Um, I can use a text editor for this purpose. So let me start up um, a text editor right here. All right, so x is really just a single Boolean variable. It can only be false or true. Okay, that part is pretty easy. So the negation of x is pretty easy too. Okay, the negation of false is true. The negation of true is simply false. Okay, that's not hard. So now we look at x NAND x, okay? So if you remember the, sim the um, operation of NAND, that's great. If you cannot remember, that's okay. We can do the long form of x NAND x, which is the negation of x and x here. So what do you think is the result of the negation of x and x when x is false? True, okay. What about the uh, negation of x and x when x is true? It will be false. Okay, very good. So you can see how the two columns, the one corresponding to not x and the one corresponding to the negation of x and y, they have exactly the same value for every row of the truth table. Right? That's how you prove the equivalency between you know, two operations or two expressions when it is Boolean. It's pretty easy, right? Because you don't have to remember, oh, okay, we have to use the associative law, we have to use the um, commutative law, and so on and so forth. Nope, you just spell it out, work it out, look at the two columns, compare. If, they, <laughs> if the two columns are exactly the same, then they are equivalent, okay? They are basically the same thing, okay? This one seems pretty easy. So the next one up is a little bit harder. We're looking at just regular conjunction. So I claim that x and x is the same thing as x and y. It's, I take it back, okay, I misspoke. I claim that x and y is the same thing as x and y, and x and y, yep. I'm not sure what you mean by that. The two exclamation point. You mean here? Yes. Yep. 
It's the negation. It's the logical knot in C or C++. But in mathematical symbol, it looks like this. So this is also, you know, I, I'm just explaining all the alternative way to express logical knot. In C++, it looks like this. In computer engineering, it looks like this. Or when you're designing circuits, you're, you're using ICs, you know, integrated circuits, it also looks like a slash and then whatever it is. You know, the slash can also mean negation when you're reading uh, the data sheet of your know, chips. <clears throat> All right. So now we are looking at conjunction. Okay, you know, X and Y is, I claim, that it is X NAND Y NAND X NAND Y. So I'm going to work this one out too, okay, because this one is fairly easy too. It's a little bit more complex because, you know, this time we have two independent variables. We have X and Y as independent variables. When X is false, Y can be false. When X is false, Y can be true. When X is true, Y can be false. When X is true, Y can be true as well. So that's why the truth table has four entries. So the first thing is, okay, let's take a look at just your X and Y. That should be pretty easy. <clears throat> so this should be false. This is false. This is false. And this is true. So now we look at the other one. Okay, so we now look at you know, the negation of X and Y, which is X and Y. And then we have another X and Y being negated. And then on top of the entire thing, we have the overall NAND, NANDing <laughs> the two of these things. So this is the spelled out version of X NAND Y NAND X NAND Y. Okay, it just looks ugly, that's all. But it means exactly the same thing. So I'm not gonna do this because you know it's a little bit tedious, but I will leave it up to you guys to do it. Okay, the current time is, um, 547 since I'm recording today so you, it means you know you can get back to this portion of the recording you know once you know what time it is but I would do this you know as an exercise okay because the, the concept of a truth table is really useful not only in CISP 310 but also in CISP 440 so if you have not taken CISP 440 yet you would it will be very beneficial, okay, you know, to learn how to use the concept of a truth table. All right. So this is just you know, going to be an exercise for you, but I am going to claim, okay, if you did it correctly, you would end up with exactly the same four values for each row. You would end up with false, 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 and then a true. All right. Are there any questions about AND before we move on to just talk about the notation of AND, which is a little bit of a repetition of what we already discussed you know, earlier in today's class. Note that the conjunction of X and Y can also be denoted as X ampersand ampersand Y in C++, X dot Y in computer engineering, or X, Y is the abbreviated you know, computer engineering not notation because you know, there's no need to use a dot here because it looks like multiplication. All right, so now, now we are moving on to or or disjunction. So or uh, disjunction, I'm using uh, the derivation here is using the Morgan's law. Yep. Uh, yes, I updated the module just a little bit last night. Uh, this is the physical state module. So this is the module in Canvas. It's called Physical States, Truth, Numbers, and Computers. And we are now at section 3.4.3. So this is about disjunction. So I claim that X or Y, logical or Y, is really the same thing as X NAND X, the whole thing, NAND Y NAND Y. So once again, you can use a truth table to prove this one as well. So if, if you have never used a truth table before, if you have never been exposed to this concept, I would do it as an exercise, okay? Because it's a very useful technique in Boolean algebra, you know, to perform, um, you know, to basically prove two expressions are really the same. All righty.
Are there any questions about you know how you can go about proving the equality or how to set up a truth table? Yep. You have two columns, okay? So if you want to work on the one with the or, so basically what you need to do is to, I'm just going to copy and paste it here a little bit. Okay, so this time instead of a and, you have a or, and then over here you have, you know, basically this is x nand x, and then this becomes y nand y, and that's the only change. But if you work out the actual value of this thing, of this long expression, it should be the same as this you know, column here, which I also need to change, okay, I forgot to do that, <clears throat> because we're dealing with or here. So it should be zero one 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 instead of zero 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 and then the one. Questions? Just to confirm uh, in really stupid words, downwards the down arrow means or and then the up arrow means or and yeah, and then the up arrow means and that is correct. So you know here we have a little bit of the explanation. Um, this is the OR, and it is basically the same thing as double bar, which is OR in C++. You're correct. All right. So any other questions? So every time you encounter a definition of something, um, my suggestion is to put it at a special place in your notes so that it's easier to look up all the definitions. It's not too bad right now, you know, most of the definitions at this point, we are not gonna be referencing those things, you know, anytime soon. But in just a little bit, you know, if we, once we get to base conversion, some of those equations, some of those formulae will be quite useful, and, you know, you probably want to have a place in your notes, you know, just for you know, all the definitions. It is not quite a reflection. <laughs> they are not, um, you only need one of them, okay? The other one can be expressed using you know, whichever one you choose, um, but both can be expressed using just NAND. They're not exactly reflection. Um, so I think uh, what you're talking about is De Morgan's Law. So let, let, let's take a look at, closer look at De Morgan's Law. De Morgan's Law is really quite interesting. The, Morgan's Law. Now this is not CISP 440, so I'm not gonna ask you guys to derive equations and prove you know, equivalency of your know, expressions, but the Morgan's Law is going to be helpful you know, for other classes that you probably have to take, you know, whether here or at a four-year university, so you might as well you know, kind of get used to it. So the Morgan's Law says, you know, um, A, uh, the negation of A and B is the same thing as not A or not B. And I'll put parentheses around these, you know, just so that it is really clear, you know, the, about you know, which operation happens first. This is one part of De Morgan's Law, and there's a second part of De Morgan's Law which looks like a mirror of this one. So the second part of De Morgan's Law says, you know, A or B, the negation of A or B, which is also called a NOR, N-O-R, is the same thing as the negation of A and the negation of B. So these two transformations together is called the Morgan's Law. Now, you see equivalency here, right? So that means, you know, to some people, it's like, okay, how do we know that these two are the same? The left-hand side and the right-hand side are, in fact, the same, regardless of the values of A and B. Truth table, okay? Make a truth table, have one column corresponding to one expression, and then have another column corresponding to whatever I claim that is equivalent to the first expression. Work it out, and you should see that for every row, of the truth table, the two expressions should have the same value. Yep. So is that why we have short expressions? Because like we have like that and expression, first column is false. If and we have a four expression, first column is false. If uh, 
Mm, not sure. I don't think you know. I, I don't think it's because of that. But if you think about it, does it make sense to you? Okay, it is not true that A and B together is true. Does it make sense that you know not A is has to be not A is true or not B is true? Does that make sense? Intuitively. So some people may think it makes sense intuitively. Intuitively, others may not. But you know, this, these are the De Morgan's laws, you know, or the two uh, equations you know, regarding De Morgan's law, and it, they, are, they become really useful in computer engineering. All right. Any other questions about um, you know how we use NAND two to express regular negation, not? regular conjunction, which is and, and regular disjunction, which is or. Are there any questions about that? Okay, if there are no rules, then we are going to consider, you know, section three done. And now we are moving on to section four. So section four basically talks about um, a number is a representation of a value of a quantity so the question, the bigger question is, what is a number versus what is a value? Okay, kept questions? Okay, are there any questions for me? <laughs> All right, do you guys have any questions for me? Oh, okay. But if you have, if you need clarification, you can always ask me. Okay, all right. So <clears throat> now we get to uh, base conversion. But before we get to base conversion, I just want to differentiate in this class what a number is and what a value is. So a number is a representation of a value. Okay, to give you an analogy, it's easy. Okay, this is a value. But what is the label? How do people know that they're referring to me? In English, you know, in the United States, I'm TAC, T-A-K, TAC. But in Hong Kong, I'm called, you know, Yuan, Dak Ying, which is my Cantonese name. In Mandarin, if I go to mainland China, it would be Ouyang De Ying, okay? My Mandarin sucks, so if you look at me and go like, oh, man, that... It's just cringe worthy. Yes, it is, you know, cringe worthy. My my Mandarin sucks. But the whole idea is they're just different labels. They're just different identi identifiers of the same person. The person is the value, and then the number is a representation of that value. I can give you another example. Okay, um, we we can just take a look at something. Okay, you know, how much does this your know, tablet weigh? That's the question. So you can say, oh, it weighs about half a pound, okay, you know, eight ounces. Eight ounces is a number. Half a pound is a number. 440 grams, no, this would be 220 grams, is yet another number using different units. But all they are doing is representing exactly the same weight, the same weight. Does it make sense to you? So there's just different ways to express the same value, you know, using different numbers. And in this, in this case, you know, the unit is important as well. So are we good so far? All right. So I think we're ready to move on to um, base conversion. But before we do that, are there any questions about the lab on Tuesday? In other words, does anyone want to want me to kind of go through that whole process to create that circuit? Nope, we all good? Okay, so someone wants me to go over that. Okay, let's do that. All right, so I'm going to start up a command line here. Um, even though only you know, very few people you know, raise their hand, you know, I think you know, it is going to be helpful you know, if I just kind of go through the process because I can also explain you know, the process you know, in just a little bit here. So I'm gonna start up Logisim. Logit sim. There we go. 
I created a shell script, you know, so that I don't have to type the entire thing all the time. All right, so I'm just gonna go through you know, the creation of the circuit really fast, but in the, at the same time, I would also explain some of the concepts. Um, so in case you have missed some of the concepts, you know, this becomes useful. So I would pick out you know, the input pins and output pins first, and I think I can zoom in at least one level. This is an input pin, this is an output pin. And in the lab, I specifically requested to create a circuit based on a diagram, a picture. So um, I think two people of the entire class you know, created the same circuit that I created in class, but not the circuit that was described in the lab. The circuit that was described in the lab have eight input, you know, uh, has eight bits for both the input and the output pins. So the data bits have to be changed to eight for both the input and the output. Um, and then we go to wiring, we need power. Okay, I'm gonna put power over here. We need ground, you know, typically you put power and ground you know, at opposite end, one to the north, one to the south. And then we need a bunch of transistors. We need four of those, okay? So we'll <clears throat> get two of these, you know, P-type transistors first, like so. And they're in the wrong orientation, so I group both of them to rotate at the same time. Okay, and one, I want the gate to be on the other side, so we change the gate location. And then we need N transistors. So one way to do it, okay, not the only way, but one way to do it is to duplicate the only two transistors that we have, and then point them a little bit differently. So this time, um, during the lab time, you know, some people forgot about the direction of the arrow, it's because you know, for a P transistor, the source has to be one. For N transistors, the source has to be zero. So that means you know, these have to be rotated um, facing north, like so, and then I can kind of align these things a little bit better. This is just for making things look nicer, that's all. Okay, so now we can um, actually complete the circuit. Yes? So if you take a P transistor and hook up the source of a P transistor to a zero, and assuming the other end is a one, then you would actually end up with a short. Um, because inside a MOSFET, these are basically way simplified deal MOSFETs, or it stands for metal oxide, I cannot remember the S, separator. Um, and then FET stands for field effect transistor. So within the MOSFET, there is a PN junction that is reverse biased. So if you hook up a transistor correctly, that, transist that, that diode is not going to be forward biased and it's not going to do a single thing. But if you flip it around and you hook up your power and ground in a reverse way, then it becomes a short. You know, basically, you have a diode that is you know, the only component in the circuit. So it's going to burn. It's going to heat up and die. But that's only if you have power and ground both hook up to it you know, at the same time, but in reverse. <clears throat> I design circuit boards too. So I have actually, and then uh, sometimes you know, the people using the circuit board would not observe the polarity of the power supply, and that's what happens. You know, the transistor just dies. Usually they die really quickly because I have fuses you know, in my circuit too, just to try to protect you know, the the components, and usually the, it's, the transistor will, will basically heat up so fast that the fuse is not useful. All right, so I have a few things to fix, you know, and then we'll go ahead and take roll, uh, because this and this are supposed to be N-type transistors, so I have to change it from P-type to N-type. All right, so this part is easy, okay, because I did it in class. The difficult part is how to use splitters, okay? Um, the video, there's an embedded video in the instruction, you know, that describes you know, how to use a splitter, what it is, how to use it, and how to configure it. So splitters are here, okay? So when you pick up a, a splitter, it looks like this. 
And then these are the um, properties of a splitter. So the properties of a splitter, there is there are a few things that are very you know, confusing. Uh, the bit width has to be eight in this case. In other words, we're dealing with eight bits on one of the two ends on the merged end of a splitter because the input pin and the output pins are both eight bit wide. So that means the splitter has to be eight bit wide as well. So the merged end is going to connect to the input pin in this case, and then the other splitter will have the merged end connecting to the output pin. So that explains you what is the bit width. Fan out is basically asking how many split ends do we have? In this case, we only need two split ends for this one, and we only need one split end to hook up to this one here. So I work on those you know, separately. The most important part is how do we know which bit is going to which split end of the splitter? So since we only have two split end, one is called top, one is called bottom. So we want bit zero to go to the top, bit one to go to the bottom, and then everything else would not have any connection, would not connect to anything on the split end, so they will all be none. So that's how we set up the splitter, and there's one more, there we go. <clears throat> the digits you know, on the split end tells you which bit we want to be on the top split end, and which bit we want to be at the bottom of the split end. So that's why you, know, you have to watch, you have to read the diagram, the, the diagram very carefully because you know, these numbers, they're all meaningful. We just have to make sure that you know, we as, you know, assign meanings to these things. All right, so the rest is just gonna wire up this one over here. And let's say this one is over here. And then this one goes over. So now we have, I have a flyover. Put this one here and also here. And the output pin requires its own uh, splitter. So I'm going to make a duplicate of this splitter because it is mostly configured correctly, not entirely. The only change I need here is to change the fan out from two to one because I only need one split end in this case. But then you know, it automatically you know, wants every single bit to go to the split end. So I'm gonna keep bit zero, but everyone else is going to be not going to the split end. So we end up with only bit zero going to the split end in this case. So that's the splitter that we need. But the orientation is opposite because the split end is coming from here. The merged end is supposed to go here. Now, if you want, if you don't want to, you know, kind of spend time to, oh, okay, that, that's not good. Oh, okay, I just did something really stupid, and I think it might have a problem. Okay, we'll see. All right, so let me get back. All right, so the split end has to be coming from here. It goes to the split end because the uh, input, the output of the circuit only has one bit, and then the merged end is going to the output pin. Okay, so it does work here. It just looks ugly. Is that okay? So that's how we make the circuit. Um, once you make this circuit, you save the circuit. So I'm gonna save this just in case you know, someone could not finish the circuit on Tuesday. I will post this in the announcement, so in case you did not finish your circuit on Tuesday, you can use the circuit that I just created. So I'm gonna save this as NAND2. Oops, NAND2. Uh, the file already exists, yes, go ahead and overwrite, and I will post it in the announcement. Is that okay so far? Because you will need this for today's lab, okay? So that's why you know, this part is important. <clears throat> so in, on the, in the lab of Tuesday, we also mentioned the appearance of a circuit, I think. Yeah, so this is the appearance of the circuit. In other words, this is looking into the body of a function definition. It's giving you all the details of you know, how the input relates to the output. 
when you go to the appearance of the circuit, you're looking at the prototype of a function. All it says is, okay, we have this one input as a parameter, and we have this output as a parameter, and they're not even labeled. So what you can do is you can label it if you want to. Um, you can use you know, the text tool you know, to label this thing any way you want. The one thing that you don't want to do is to move these pins around, okay? Because when you move these pins around, then my automated your grading tool is not going to work. So you just leave the pin positions as they are, but then you can add your labels if you want to. For instance, one way you, know, you can add label is just to put a label tool here and then just place it somewhere, type NAN2, and now you have a component called NAN2. So this becomes available as a component that you can use to create larger and more complex you know, circuits. Just like you can use a function, call a function from another function to build you know, more complexity into your program. It's the same idea. Do we have any questions about this part? Nope, okay. So I'm gonna save this and post it as an announcement. I'll do it right away because if I don't, I will forget. And then we'll take roll. So you might want to sign in to um, Canvas now. Um, I will get to that as soon as possible. All right, you may not, yeah, it, there we go, all right. Okay, so check the announcement if you want to use my circuit, and now we are going to take roll, so take your cell phone or laptop computer or tablet out. You cannot see it yet because I have not exposed it yet. Today is the 18th. So I'm gonna expose it right now. If you refresh your browser, you should be able to see it. But then you, doesn't, you don't know the, uh, the passcode for today. It is NAND, N-A-N-D, all lowercase, is the access code of today's uh, role taking activity. Oh, yeah. I was originally planning to do it a, lot, a little bit earlier and then I kept talking. Let me change that first. What time is it? 13, ah, okay. Let's make it 6.20, uh, that should be plenty of time. PM, PM. There we go, save. All right, so refresh your browser and you should be able to get in and then use the access code of NAND to basically tell me that you're here. I think it beats passing a piece of paper around. All right, looks like most people are done with that. So, you know, for, if you still need a few more seconds, that's okay, because I need to navigate to the base conversion module so that you know where to find it, right? All right, so base conversion is um, down here a little bit. It's about values, numbers, and bases. It doesn't say base conversion, but it, it says you know, values, numbers, and bases. It is about base conversion. So I do want to point out what it looks like. Okay, this is what it looks like. Super boring, I don't use pictures or diagrams, so it looks really boring. It doesn't mean that you don't have to read it. You still have to read it. You just have to uh, you know, kind of make it a little, more, little bit more interesting as you're reading it. You can take notes, you can draw your own pictures about your know, things you know, when you're, you're reading this. All right. So instead of reading my own notes, which is going to bore me to death, I'm going to tell you guys that you already know about the base conversion the moment, well, I mean, you know, okay. Let me, let me ask another question. How many of you think you can work at McDonald's, you know, um, making change you know, for, your, for the customers? Okay, 
I see some people are not raising their hand. <laughs> okay, I'm assuming that everybody in this class knows how to use the least number of coins and bills to come up with the same amount of, to come up with some amount of money. Okay, so we're going to, I'm going to test you guys. Because, you know, this is important. This is really important stuff, you know, how to make change at McDonald's. So let's just say that, you know, you have to make a change of uh, $6. And um, there are certain values I cannot use. So I'm going to use uh, $6.25. Okay, this is the actual change amount. Okay. <clears throat> and you're working at McDonald's. So do you know how many bills and coins to use to make up for this amount of money? Well, I know the easiest way to do this is to give the customer 625 pennies. But that may not be the best way to do it. My supervisor may not like that. It's like, why are we always running out of pennies when, when everything else is still in the cash register? Okay, so you already know. I know you guys already know you need one quarter, one $1 bill, and one $5 bill. Well, you implicitly know how to do base conversion already. Okay? So the way you think about base conversion in this case is to think about a strange, okay, in quotes, a strange um, currency system where you have dollar and then $2 bills, $4 bills, $8 bills, $16 bills, and so on. And then on the other side, you have coins. You have half dollar coins, you have quarter dollar coins, you have eighth dollar coins, and so on. So do you see a regularity in this case? What is the regularity of this particular currency system? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. They're all even. Well, I wouldn't say one half is an even, even number. Go ahead. Mm. Almost. Okay, go ahead. Okay. They're, well, they're not base two, but they are powers of two. They're quantities that are powers of two. You go like, okay, I can see how two is a power of two because two is two to the power of one. Four is a power of two because you know, two squared is four. Eight is a power of two because eight, two to the power of three is eight and so on. How is one a power of two? Two to the power of zero. Very good. Uh, what about a quarter? That doesn't sound like a power of two. Two to the power of negative two because I said a quarter. But yes, you, you got the idea. Okay. So we are talking about powers of two. So as strange as it may seem, okay, because you're, you're, you guys are used to your know, quarters, dimes, nickels, and so on, and the $1 bills, $5 bills, $10 bills, this is way easier. Okay, let me, let, let's compare the two currency system. The U.S. currency system, as it is right now, starts with a penny, which is your know, 0.01 of a dollar. The next one is what? A nickel, and then what do we have? A dime, and then what do we have? Quarter, and then, yeah, I know we have half dollars, but they're not usual. So what is the next common? A dollar, and then we have two dollar bills, but we, 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 they're not common. So five dollar bills, ten dollar bills, twenty dollar bills, fifty dollar bills. Well, I'm not wealthy, so this is where I stop. <clears throat> Okay, do you see any regularity in this pattern? A multiplier of five, two, two and a half, four. We are not even repeating the numbers yet. And then five again, you go like, oh, okay, great. Five and then two and then two and a half. No, just two. And then you go like, oh, then we have a two and a half. It's like, there's no pattern to this. And yet, you have already mastered this. Okay, let's compare the other way, okay? The other way, which is tax way, if I were a politician, this would be my platform. Just something 
pragmatic, okay? So tax, you know, if I were a politician, okay, I will still have a dollar bill, but then I'll have a half dollar, you know, half dollar coin, and then we'll have, you know, quarter dollar coin, and if people care, we'll have an eighth dollar coin. If <laughs> I don't think it matters. And then on the other side, we have two dollar bills, four dollar bills, eight dollar bills, sixteen dollar bills, and so on. This would be my platform. I think I would be elected. Because it is so easy. You know, if you imagine, you know, someone, you know, an immigrant who is coming from a different country and really need to learn about the currency system, which one do you think is easier to learn? There's no comparison. There's no comparison whatsoever. So, but we are talking about base conversion here, right? So now I'm asking you, okay, if I were to use, okay, 6.25, 6 if you use the usual currency system, is a five times a plus a one plus a quarter. But it is also using the other currency system, using my currency system, what is it going to look like? A four, a two, and a quarter. Okay. Okay, great. So it, it, it can express the same amount of you know um, money, but how is this base conversion, right? This doesn't look like base conversion. So let's take a look at, okay, we have one of two to the power of two. I'm just gonna hijack the caret symbol to mean to the power of, because the actual meaning of the caret symbol in C++ is not power of. What is it? The caret symbol is an actual operator in C++, but it doesn't mean to the power of. What is it? It's bitwise exclusive or. Okay? Most people do not need to use it, but if you are a computer engineer and you have to work with your know, chipsets and you have to write drivers, you know, that sort of thing, it is a very useful operator. Okay? So I'm just you know, giving you guys a little bit of context here. Uh, plus two to the power of one, because that's the two, and then plus two to the power of negative two. Okay. So the way we write two to the power of two is in binary. Hmm, how do we write that? So you have to kind of think about in base 10, how do you write 10 to the power of two as a base 10 number? In base 10, okay, so we, we are trying to express 100 as a quantity, as a base 10 number. What does it look like? 100 is, okay, spell out the digits. One, zero, zero, okay? Okay, so this is actually one, zero, zero in base two. That's two to the power of two. Two to the power of one is one, zero in base two. And then two to the power of negative two is 0 0.01 in base two. You look at this and go like, Okay, so we, I'm not really sure about all of this stuff here. This is all new to me. Um, I'm not really quite you know, getting it. That's okay. So let's, take a, let's go all the way back to look at 6.25 as a decimal number, as a base 10 number. Um, in fact, we'll make this a little bit larger. Okay, so we'll say 36.25, okay? What is the three representing in 36.25? What is it telling me? We have three of tens. Okay, very good. So that means you know, the three means you know, that's 30. The six means we have six of ones. Okay, that's where the six is. The two is, you know, we have two of point 0.1. That's where we get the point 0.2. And then the five means we have five of point 0.01s, and that's why we get the point 0.05. But if I break this up a little bit more, then we have three times 10 to the power of one plus six times 10 to the power of zero, plus two times 10 to the power of negative one, plus uh, five times 10 to the power of negative two. So let me just you know, kind of use some spacing here so that it just looks, oh, okay, wrong kind of spacing. Um, oh, right, okay, that's the right place to space in about a little bit, okay. Would, does anyone want to talk about this? You go like, 
okay, your middle school students can do this. So what is the whole point? The whole point is the positioning of a digit tells you what quantity it is a magnitude, what, how many of each quantity, okay? Um, the three being here tells us that we have three of tens. The six being here tells us we have six of ones. The two being here tells us that we have two of 0.1, which is a power of 10. And then the five being here tells us that we have five of 0.1s, which is a power of 10 as well. Is that okay? That's how numbers work. Now, we never really kind of talk about it or we never really think about these because we just intuitively understand you know, how numbers work. But once we kind of dissect how a base 10 number work, then we can also understand how a base two number work. Because in this case, if you're talking about base two, two to the power of two means we have one of two to the power of two, that's why we have a one here. Two to the power of one, we have one of those, that's why we have a one zero in base two. And then you know, two to the power of negative two, we have one of those, and that's why we have a 0 0.01 here. So is that okay? I mean, I, you know, because I think there may be some gaps you know, between, the, um, between the base 10 representation and the base two representation, but yeah. Mm, not really, not really helpful. Because, okay, let's, let's make it a little bit more general, okay? So let's just say we have a number, you know, W, X, point, Y, Z, in a particular base, we'll just call it base B, okay? What is the quantity? What is the value represented by this number? So base B means, you know, B is base 10 for most of the numbers that we work with, okay? That's the default, simply because we got 10 fingers. So... The value represented here is W times what? We have W of B, the base to the power of what? What is the position of W? No, <laughs> one, okay? B to the power of one, plus what about X? X is telling us the quantity of B to the power of what? Zero, very good, okay, what about Y? Negative one, yes. And then z is b to the power of negative two. Is that okay? So b is really just a base, which typically is an integer, even though it doesn't really have to be integers, but it makes sense that we have b as an integer. So we are used to b being 10, because it's base 10, okay? We have been using base 10 all along. What if I were to switch b to two? It's the same idea with one added advantage. When you look at base 10 numbers, what are the available digits? For each digit in a base 10 number, what are my choices? How many choices do we have? We have 10 choices from zero to nine, okay? Because 10 as a quantity cannot be represented by a single digit in base 10, okay? So it sounds like the, the highest digit in a particular base is that base minus one, right? What about base two? How many digits do we have? Two, and which those, which, what are those two digits? Zero and one. Huh, okay. That is nice, because we, we only got two digits to play with. Guess what? Multiplication gets a whole lot easier. Division gets a whole lot easier. Addition gets a whole lot easier, and then subtraction also gets a whole lot easier. That would be part of my platform if I were to become a politician, is to change from base 10 to base 2. All the parents will frown, but all the kids in elementary school, they will vote for me, although they're a little bit too young. Because, you know, you look at, okay, look at the multiplication table. How long did it take you to, to, to memorize the multiplication table? It took you a little bit of time, right? I cannot remember how long, but. <laughs> but how many entries are in the multiplication table? Strictly speaking, 100 items. But since 
uh, multiplication is commutative, which means you know, x times y is the same as y times x. So you can say, oh, okay, we can chop it in one half. You still have 50 items. Then you go like, oh, but you know, one entire row, you know, we don't have to remember that because zero times whatever is just zero. Okay, strike that out. So now you have 40 items. And then the next row is also super easy because one times whatever is just that whatever. So now you strike out another row. So now you have, what, 40 minus 9, which is 31 items to, to memorize. It is still a lot. Until you have mastered multiplication, forget about division. You cannot do division without first mastering multiplication. Okay, think about base 2 multiplication. How big is that table? There are four items. How many, what are those four items? Okay, zero times zero is a zero. Zero times one is a, is a zero. One times zero is a zero. One times one is a one. How long do you think it will take an elementary school student to remember that? Half a class period. Okay, so we are going to see the advantages of base two later on, but right now we focus on base conversion. Okay, all right. So it looks like we know how to do base conversion. So I'm going to throw throw you a wrench here, and I ask, what is 100 in base 10 in as a base seven number? So I'm going to call the base seven number x y z, x y z in base seven. <clears throat> so how do we solve this problem? Okay, so getting back to the currency system, okay? Base 2 means I have $1 bills, $2 bills, $4 bills, $8 bills, and so on. Base 7 means I have $1 bills, $7 bills, $49 bills, and then 49 times you know, $7 bills, and so on. Does that make sense? Okay, so, we, so we're going to cheat a little bit here. So we're going to say, you know, 100 is going to be x times 7 to the power of 2 plus y times 7 uh, to the power of 1 plus z times 7 to the power of 0. Is that okay? Hmm? No, we will be good. Oh, we no, we don't need another digit. We, we are good. Okay, so now the question is, um, are there any further restrictions? The answer is, yeah, we got some other restrictions. X as a digit can only go from 0 to 6, Y can only go from 0 to 6, and Z can only go from 0 to 6. Okay, so which one are you going to work out first? If you were to do this by hand, okay, not using an equation, which one are you going to work on first? The highest one, right? It's just like when you need to make change for a customer. You look at the number, okay, you look at the value, let's say $16 and, you know, 65 cents. Are you going to start with $1 bills? No. Are you going to start with pennies? No. You start, I mean, you, you might start with $50 bills and go like, ah, no, we don't need $50 bills. We don't need $20 bills. Ah, one of those, $10 bills, right? So you start with the higher end of the powers, which means in this case, we want to figure out how many 49s are in 100. Okay, so we will solve that. Okay, so we'll, we'll say, hmm, looks like there are two of those, right? Two times seven to the power of two, Okay, so now we still have to figure out the rest. I'm going to <clears throat> copy and paste the rest here. But once you figure out uh, we need two of the 49s, because 149 is 7 squared, um, we only got two left, right? A quantity of two left. So how many 7s do we need to represent two? None of those, okay? So now we go like, okay, we know what y is. Okay, so we, I'm just going to copy and paste a little bit here. We got zero of those. And now we, we still have the quantity of two, but we are down to ones. How many ones do we need 
to represent two. It's just two, okay, cool. So two times seven to the power of zero. So this means 100 in base 10 is 202 in base seven. Does that make sense to you? I specifically chose a really awkward base just so that you, know, you understand the nature of the conversion. Is that okay? So who would use a base seven number? Okay, and um, they're called heptapods. Heptapods, hepta means your know, seven, and pod means limbs. So heptapod are you know, you know, beings or creatures with your know, seven limbs. Like those you know, in the movie of Arrival. The science fiction movie Arrival, you know, those you know, alien beings have seven limbs. They are heptabots. But we also have octopus. You go like attack. Octo means you know, octa means you know, eight. You know, so they're not going to use base seven. But wait, if they need one tentacle to hold on to the beer, then they only have seven tentacles left for counting. So I think you know, really cool octopus would use base seven because they are always holding to that can of beer. And if anyone objects and go like, how can octopi drink beer? They're in the water, right? I got two answers for you. One, SpongeBob. <laughs> two, octopi are known to get out of their aquarium, walk on land, get to the aquarium that has crabs, eat the crabs, get back on ground, and back into their own aquarium. So they can indeed get out of the aquarium, hold the beer, drink the beer, and then get back into the aquarium. So yes, I got an answer to all of those you know, questions that you might have in your mind. Okay, we are we're diverse, digressing more and more away from base conversion. <clears throat> uh, do you guys want to work on another example? Okay, let's work on another one. Uh, what do you want to do? Sorry? <laughs> we can do base five because you know, insects have six limbs. They need one to hold on to the beer, right? So we can work with base five. But this time, I'm going to flip it around too. So we're going to start with a base five number, and then we'll convert it back, convert it back to what we are used to, which is base 10. How's that? Sounds good? Okay. All right. All right, so tell me what are the available digits in a base five number? <laughs> Zero to four, very good. Okay, so we have to keep that in mind. So we're gonna have, I'm just generating a random number here, four, one, three, two, okay, as a base five number. So now we go like, okay, the cockroach you know, is telling me a number of four, one, three, two, you know, what is that in base 10? And cockroaches are insects. They have six limbs. Okay, so what is that in, in base 10? How, how do we do this? What is the four, ref okay, let's start with the two. What is the two representing based on where it is in the number? It's representing the quantities of five to the power of zero. Is that okay? All right, <clears throat> so we have two times five to the power of zero. What about the three? What is it representing? The quantities of five to the power of one. Yep, mm -hmm. And what about the uh, next one, which is a one? Five to the power of two, okay, very good. And then the last one is four times five to the power of three. Is that okay? All right, well, should be pretty easy from here on. This is just a two. This is a 15, this is a 25, and this is 500. Come on, your mental ma math, right? Five squared is 25, five cubed is 125, and then four times 125 is 500. Because four times 100 is 400, and then the 25 left 
times four is another 100. You add the extra 100 to the first 400, you get 500. Mental math, mental math. <clears throat> All right, so you just add up these numbers, okay, because you know, I really want to get the whole thing together. So we have 500 and what, 42 in base 10. Is that okay? So this entire exercise has to do with how do we read a number? What is each digit in the number representing? What is the meaning of those your digits? Okay, are we doing okay so far? But I want to double check, okay? So I'm gonna go the other way around. I want to look at 542 and see if I can do the base conversion back to base five and get this back, okay? So how would I do that? So one thing that can be very helpful is to first spell out the powers of five. One is a power of five, five is a power of five, 25 is a power of five, 125 is a power of five. And you can go up to the next one too, it's not necessary, okay, but you can still work it out. So five times 125 is 625, that's also a power of five. So now the question is, um, how do we figure out which one do we need? I'm pretty sure we don't need 625 because the quantity that we want to represent is less than 625. So we need zero of 625. Does that make sense? Okay. What about 125? You can do a division. Okay. So the way you do this is to basically say, okay, we have 544 left. Let's do a division by 125. And then we only need the integer portion of this new division. So that turns out to be eh, four with a remainder of what, uh, 42, right? <clears throat> so 42 becomes the remaining portion that I need to represent using the other powers of, you know, the, the lower powers of five. So I look at 42, I look at 25, eh, this one is pretty easy. That is a one with a remainder of, oof, arithmetic is not easy for me. Is it 17? Okay. So now we only have five and one left. I need to represent you know, 17. 17 divided by five is a three with a remainder of two. So with a remainder of two, I only got ones left. So that's two divided by one, which is two with a remainder of zero. I mean, you can keep the same pattern. And how do we read this number? Four, one, three, two. Four, one, three, two. So we got the same base, base five number back. Yep. A seven would not be a digit in base five, right? So we, <laughs> so it doesn't make sense. <laughs> Give me an example. So we were trying to convert um, 642 to base 10, right? So if you were to do one, times 10. Yeah. So in this case, we have 625 times 1, right? So, okay, we can use exactly the same method. So let me, let me use the same method here. 642 divided by 625, which is a power of five, is one with a remainder of 17, right? And then you look at 17 divided by 125. Now remember, we want to keep using the same exact equations just repetitively because this makes it programmable. Okay, because if we use the same pattern over and over again, and we don't have to say, well, in this special case we do this, but in the other special case we do that, that becomes difficult to code. So we're gonna keep the same pattern here. It is workable, because you know, this one simply has a quotient of zero, which is nothing special at all, right? Okay, not a problem. So now we move down to the next uh, power of five, which is this five itself, uh, nope, 25, sorry. So it is a zero with a remainder of 17 again, and then we have 17 divided by 5, which is a 3 with a remainder of 2. 
and now we have 2 divided by 1, which is 2 with a remainder of 0. So in this case, the base 5 number is going to be 1, 0, 0, 3, 3, 2 in base 5. Is that okay? Yep. That's base conversion. It is it's a very easy concept. It really depends on how you look at it. If you start to look at it from the perspective of you know, making change, like in terms of currency, you go through the same exercise, except this time it is a whole lot more structured. Because you know, otherwise you have to do a bunch of division, but you also have to remember you know, what are the denominations available in a particular currency system. In this case, it's all powers of the same base. So it makes it very consistent, very easy to work with, but the idea is still the same. It's based on division. Well, it's based on division for all the bases except for base two. So let's check out you know, how, do, how we work with base two in this case. I know we are almost running out of time, but you know, not quite yet. So this time we want to convert 642 to base two. Uh, yes. Hmm? Well, technically speaking, we can use exactly the same technique, which is division, and then we look at the, we look at the um, quotient and the remainder, and then we can apply exactly the same method. However, because it is base two, it means we can only have one or zero of something. That means comparison is sufficient. Okay, so let's spell out all the powers of 2 first. 1,024, 512, 256, uh, 128, 64, 32, 16, 8, 4, 2, 1. Okay, so these are the powers of 2. And the way we look at this is to go like, this time it's only comparison. So we go like, you know, 10, 24 is greater than <clears throat> or equal to 642. So that means you know, we, have, we, we need zero of 1,024. Does that make sense? Okay, moving down here. Ah, okay, this one is less than or equal to 642. So I think it is supposed to be just greater than, not greater than or equal to. So we're gonna have one, okay? But then we also have to look at the remaining portion, which in this case is 130. So we have 130 left. Um, this is greater than 130. So we don't need um, a 256. Um, this one is less than or equal to 130. So we need one of those, and we have two left in this case. Uh, and then we have a whole bunch of greater than, because 64 is greater than 2, which means we need zero of this. 60, 32 is greater than 2. We, have a z we, we need zero of 32, which is a power of, all of these are powers of 2, right? So we just keep this pattern here until we get to two. Uh -huh. There we go. And this is greater than two. So we don't need the four. Ah, this one is less than or equal to two. We're gonna take one of those. But once we have that, we have none. There's no value left, okay? We have zero left. So one is uh, greater than zero. So we're gonna have zero of those. So that means, how do we read the digits? Which one is our most significant digit that has to go all the way to the left, and which one is the least significant digit which has to go all the way to the right? What do you think? The top digit, okay, this guy here, where, do you, where does it go? All the way to the left or all the way to the right? All the way to the left, right, because that's our convention. For base 10 numbers, the most significant digit is all the way to the left. So we're gonna do it the same way here. So this number is 0101, zero, one, one, and a bunch of zeros, five of those, one, two, three, four, five, one zero in base two is basically representing 642. But this time, we did not even need to do division. All we did was comparison, right? It's easier. Because division is not easy. Division, you know, the way we did all the division with the remainder, I had to do mental math in my head the entire time. 
This time, it's just comparing. Really easy to do. All right, so the lecture is over. Today's lab does not have to do with base conversion. It really still kind of goes back to the NAND2 gate. But I do need to show you the passcode so that you guys can get started as soon as you get to the lab. So you might want to write it down. Okay, so uh, unhide this and this one. And it is Nandroid. Just think of Android with an N in front of it. So Nandroid is the access code of today's lab. As soon as you go to the lab, you know, this should be open already. You can get started. I'm going to arrive, you know, in just a little bit. Hopefully today I'm not going to slip on that muddy spot, you know. Yep, last time I did. Hmm? Yeah. Yeah, I, I slipped, you know, so mud got into my phone, my computer, you know, my gadget bag, you know, everything was muddy. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so I'm going to walk around that muddy spot today. What's the DeMarcus Law about? Hmm? Sorry, I missed the first portion of the lecture. What was the DeMarcus Law? Um, that's just, you know, a, a way for me to derive the equations to use NAND to implement you know all the other gates. Gotcha. Okay. Yep.